Over the course of this channel so far, we have covered the story of several men from the region who have gone on to be awarded the country's highest military honour of the Victoria Cross. Some won it out of a sense of duty, some out of protection of their friends, and others because they simply had no other choice. But the man we bring you today is slightly different. With his attitudes and outlook on life, and the decision he made during the heat of battle in the First World War, seems to have won him the Victoria Cross out of sheer stubbornness and not wishing to back down from a fight. And it would not be the only gallantry award he would receive. But he would not be one who would seek fame, although, as you will see, did have a brush with Hollywood later on in life. Arthur Henry Cross was born on the 13th of December, 1884, in a small countryside cottage opposite the local chapel in the Norfolk village of Shindon. He was one of five children born to William Cross, a local wheelwright and carpenter, and his wife Emma. Like many young children of this time, in his youth Arthur attended a local Sunday school, and in 1898 was given his own pocket Bible that he would keep with him his entire life, and use the front blank pages to record his wedding anniversaries, birth of his children, and as you will later see, the tragic deaths of many of those close to him. Arthur spent the first 17 years of his life growing up locally. He was never very gifted when it came to his education and left school at 15 with no qualifications, finding employment working as the delivery boy for a local butcher's shop and tended to go by Henry more than Arthur and sometimes by the nickname Crossy. He grew up tall for the time at six foot tall, was powerfully built and was a straight talking man who at times could be incredibly stubborn. In 1901, at the age of 17, he left the village to go and look for work of his own. According to family rumour, his real reason for leaving was he wanted to join the army and fight in the ongoing Boer War in South Africa, but the army turned him down. Refusing to go home, instead heading south for London, he would hold a number of small jobs before starting work as a labourer on the Great Eastern Railway. Receiving very little pay, he lived in squalid conditions in rented rooms all over the city of London, as he refused to give up and return to Norfolk, seeing that anything was better than finding work in a farm, like many of his local friends had. It was also while at the age of 17 he would meet and marry his first wife, a woman named Teresa Grace Coxhead from Camberwell, and the pair were fast to start a family. Having in total six children, two years after the marriage, word reached Arthur that back in Norfolk William, his father, had passed away. It would be the first of many deaths that would plague him throughout his life, including of his six children, three of them that would die before their third birthday. From the outset, Arthur's life was not going to be an easy one, and he especially struggled through the early years of the 20th century. But the world that Arthur and millions knew was destroyed forever on the 28th of July 1914, when the escalating tensions in Europe exploded into all-out war that in one way or another would consume them all. Across the country and the empire, regiments were marching off. Reserves were called back to the colours, and practically every young man of the villages, towns and cities was joining up, in many cases never to return again. Getting on for 30 years old when war was declared, Arthur was not expected to join up in that opening rush of patriotism. Besides, he was now a married man with children, and after all, it was going to be a short war. Plus, his new job kept him away from a life in khaki, no longer working for the railways, having now found work in the Woolwich Royal Dockyards, a job that was protected as vital work for the country. But as the months went on and the front lines froze into static trenches, it soon became clear that the war was going to be anything but short and more recruits were going to be needed. What would bring Arthur into uniform was known as the Derby Scheme, set up by Edward George Villiers Stanley. 17th Earl of Derby, and was a way to increase volunteers into the army that lent heavily on tactics of manipulation, guilt tripping, and in some cases outright threats. Its main target was every man between 18 and 41 who was not in essential service. Although, for men like Arthur who were, they were more than happy for them to volunteer and be included as well. They used the National Registry so they could get the names, and sent officials to their homes to talk them into signing up. Wounded former soldiers, or the family members of fallen ones, were often used to get the best results. The men were given a letter signed by the Earl of Derby, telling them that the country was in a fight for its very survival, and it was down for them to do their part. Those who agreed were given 48 hours to report to a local recruiting office. 
where they were placed on a reserve list in accordance to their age and marital status, with younger, single men being called up first. Arthur was keen to sign up for this scheme, possibly persuaded by the added incentive of all those who did were paid a bonus of one day's wages. With his age and being married, Arthur was informed that he was pretty low down on the list, so he did not have to worry about being called up right away. He was given a grey and red armband to wear in public, so all could see he was doing his bit, and was told to wait for his call update. Arthur's time came on the 30th of May 1916, and he was marched to the recruiting hall in Flodden Road, Camberwell, to enlist in the 21st London Regiment, Surrey Rifles, as part of the 142nd Brigade of the 47th London Division. Although Arthur was not to be with them for long, while still in training, he heard the newly formed Machine Gun Corps was looking for volunteers, and he jumped at the chance, being sent to Grantham in Lincolnshire to be trained on the workings and the use of the Vickers machine gun. Passing the course, he was assigned to the 121st Company Machine Gun Corps, who was part of the 40th Division. As Arthur would soon come to realise, the Machine Gun Corps was already earning itself a rather grim nickname of the Suicide Club, given the large amount of casualties they were routinely suffering as they were often enemy target number one during any form of action. Little is known about Arthur's first few months in combat. He left virtually no written records of it, and like so many of his generation, never felt it was appropriate to talk about his time in the Great War, but it is unlikely to have been a pleasant experience. The 40th Division saw heavy and brutal fighting throughout 1917, around Arras in the spring, and the capture of Bourline Woods during the autumn, also fighting around Cambrai, they suffered heavy casualties. Although so little is known about his time in the front line, behind the lines he seems to have been less than a model soldier, often in trouble for his actions, comments, as well as being known to like his drink, and obviously not seen as a man who you would give any great responsibility to. As despite the huge losses and turnover of men in his unit that year, by the end of 1917 he'd only reached the rank of acting Lance Corporal. As 1917 turned to 1918 on the Western Front, and the front line settled down as the Passchendaele offensive came to a stuttering halt. There were few who realised, especially Arthur, that they were on course to face down one of the largest German attacks of the war. The Kaiserschlant, Kaiser's Battle, sometimes known simply as the Spring Offensive, was a large-scale attack on the Allied lines across the Western Front by the German army. Using gas, artillery, tanks and specially trained stormtroopers, who were to clear the way for the main force of the army, Reinforced by 50 divisions brought in, as the fighting on the Eastern Front had now ended, it was in many ways the last roll of the dice. The Royal Navy's blockade on their ports was starving them into submission, a fact that many of those coming from the fighting in Russia witnessed firsthand, badly affecting their morale. And now, the American armed forces were beginning to arrive in strength. They had to break the Allied lines and force a surrender, before the fresh troops of the American Expeditionary Force were ready to fight. The Spring Offensive began on the 21st of March, 1918. Acting Lance Corporal Arthur Cross, now 33, aided in the running No. 4 Section, C Company, 40th Battalion, the Machine Gun Corps, and he, along with the rest of the 40th, were in reserve at the time, enjoying a well-earned rest from the trenches. When they were suddenly mobilised and sent forward to help the near-decimated 3rd Army hold on desperately to the old Somme battlefields, what followed was four days of intense and horrific fighting that saw the men of the Machine Gun Corps live up to their grim nickname. Although German losses were just as high, but they seemingly came on as if they were being told to disregard the losses and were pressing home the attack every chance they had. It was the 24th of March 1918, three days after the offensive had begun. Arthur and what was left of Number 4 section were dug in on Heron Hill, around the ruins of Arius in France and things were looking grim. They had held the position for 60 hours, under orders to hold to the last man and the last round, supporting units of the 119th Brigade. They had fought off one large-scale German attack, and now another one was being prepared to launch. When this one came, it was supported by a gas attack, and they soon found their position untenable. With even the commander of the area, Brigadier General Frank Crawser, sending the order that the men should cut and run. But for the others to get away, there needed to be a rearguard to hold back the German forces. The job fell to the machine gunners. Among the last who were able to escape as the Germans inevitably closed in was Arthur. 
being able to make a run for it just before his position was surrounded and rushed, killing or capturing all those who remained, and giving the attitudes both sides had towards machine gunners, viewing them in the same way they viewed flamethrower troops and snipers, captured was the far less likely option. Arthur was successful in his retreat, and made it back to the relative safety of the new British lines, and now night fell. Arthur took stock of his losses, that for his section counted to 50% of the men and two of the four Vickers machine guns. He knew that something had to be done, and he began to hatch a plan over the next few hours. Once Corporal Cross was able to talk his sergeant, a Sergeant Brennan, into agreeing to his audacious plan, that he would go forward and make a reconnaissance of the position, in hopes that maybe others could be sent forward to get their machine guns back. He left the trench just as the sun began to rise, armed only with a pistol, and he alone advanced on the captured section of trenches. He crept through the carnage undetected, right up to the edge of their former position, and unsurprisingly found it occupied by a squad of seven Germans. Undeterred, and not a man who was ever to back down from anything, Arthur leapt to his feet, right into the view of the enemy, and aimed his pistol at the group. Despite outnumbering Arthur, and being flushed from the last few days of victory, the squad surrendered to him on sight, possibly fearing that he was the first man in an oncoming attack. Jumping into the trench, Cross quickly took control of his newfound prisoners and began to put them to good use. He disassembled the two machine guns, loaded his seven prisoners up with the gun, tripod and as much ammunition as they could carry and marched them back to British lines. According to some sources, after his return, as the Germans were being marched away to prison camps behind the Allied lines, Arthur demonstrated that the pistol had in fact never been loaded. But if this is true, or just a story that's been attached to it, I do not know. His near suicidal act of bravery done, Arthur gathered his men together and reassembled the guns ready for action. Sure enough, the action soon came once again, with the two extra machine guns giving the British the edge in the upcoming battle. The German forces attacked in six waves, and six times they were forced back throughout the day, until night fell once again, and Arthur and his beleaguered unit were pulled out, having suffered 153 casualties in five days of fighting. Unknown to Arthur, his actions on the 25th of March had been seen and well noted by his superiors, and would see him awarded none other than the Victoria Cross. The announcement was made in the London Gazette, the paper that has announced every VC since their creation in the 1850s. His citation read, The most conspicuous bravery and initiative. Lance Corporal Cross volunteered to make a reconnaissance of the position of the two machine guns which had been captured by the enemy. He advanced single-handed to the enemy trench, and with his revolver forced seven of the enemy to surrender, and carry the machine guns, with their tripods and ammunition to our lines. He then handed over his prisoners, collected his teams for his guns, which he brought into action with exceptional dash and skill, annihilating a very heavy attack by the enemy. It is impossible to speak too highly of the extreme gallantry, initiative and dash displayed by this NCO, who showed throughout four days of operations supreme devotion to duty. The Victoria Cross for retaking the guns would not be his only bravery award. Just a couple of months later, his actions and determination in defending a bridge from a German attack saw him earned the military medal. And he, as well as the rest of the 40th, fought throughout the spring offensive, with a battalion being praised for its courage and devotion to duty. Shortly afterwards, he was also promoted to full corporal. He was awarded his medal on the 5th of September 1918 at Buckingham Palace by King George V. His was the 965th VC to be awarded. Attending the service was his mother, his wife and two children, 10-year-old Rose and a newly born Victor. A happy day with a mix of emotions, as two of his children had died in the last couple of years, including one killed in an air raid, a chilling foreshadowing of what was still to come for him. The same month he would return to the village of his birth on the 16th and was greeted with a hero's welcome, and a party was held on the village green, where he was presented with a gold watch by the village's vicar, carrying the inscription, presented by the people of Shindham to Lance Corporal A.H. Cross, V.C., September 1918. He also received £150 from his former employer at the Woolwich Dockyards. Not long after, though, Arthur found himself in deep trouble with the army when he was charged with being absent without leave, for not reporting back to his unit at the end of his granted leave period to receive his Victoria Cross. He was found in Deerham and handed over to the military police. 
While being arrested in Durham, he spotted a local reporter and called out to him. This is what I get for winning the VC for the Machine Gun Corps. Despite his insistence that he had been granted extra leave so he could go and visit his mother. Others have argued that it's possible that his two gallantry awards and his newly found celebrity had rather gone to his head and he had invented this extra leave period for himself. His military career ended on the 31st of March 1919, just over a year since his heroic actions in France. But with the war now over, the army had little need for heroes. So Arthur, like millions, were thrown back into civilian life. With no job waiting and carrying lingering illnesses and injuries from the war, he soon fell on very hard times after his money ran out. Unemployed and now classed as disabled, he also developed gastritis that plagued him very badly. Eventually, he was able to find work as what was known as a council scavenger, a sort of official rag and bone man who went around collecting unwanted fabric, wood and bones to be recycled or made into glue. It was not a particularly glamorous job, but with a wage of £3.17 shillings a week, it put food on the table. His post-military career would be plagued with several run-ins with the law, almost all of them connected with trying to get extra money for his family, such as ending up in court in 1923 for loitering for the purposes of street betting, and later being fined for stealing a postal order during his time working at the post office. He would eventually find a long-running job, though, as a city messenger. His wife Teresa passed away in October 1931, leaving him to finish raising Rose and Victor by himself. During the early 30s, he met a new woman, Minnie Harrison, and the pair moved into 50 Douglas Building, Peabody Estate, Minnie Street, Southwark, in 1934, and they were married that August. The new home would bring years of happy memories and the start of a new family, only for it to be destroyed in the blink of an eye during one of the darkest days in London's history. Like many of the First World War veterans, when the Second World War began in 1939, Arthur was keen to do his bit once again, became a member of the Civil Defence Volunteers and worked as a fire spotter. Arthur would not be affected for the first 20 months of the Second World War, but when it hit home, it would devastate everything he knew. It was the 10th of May, 1941. The air raid sirens sounded as they had done many times before, and soon, from high above, the bombs were raining down all around the Cross household. Despite the begging from Minnie, Arthur refused to leave the building this time to go to the nearby shelter, declaring, I lived through the First War. If they're going to get me now, it's in my own home. Knowing there was no winning in an argument when Arthur was in this kind of mood, Minnie took their two children, Mary and Terence, aged five and three, to the air raid shelter, while he remained in the house when suddenly the ground shook by an explosion very close by. The air raid shelter had taken a direct hit, killing everyone inside. The blitz came to an end 24 hours later. Despite still keeping in contact with the children from his first marriage, Arthur would live alone for the rest of his life, and for a time slipped into obscurity. A very strange development to his story happened in the early 1950s. The world of film came calling. The military legal drama Carrington V.C. had started production, a film about a decorated war hero who finds himself in court being accused of embezzling money from his regiment, and starred David Niven, a soldier himself, first in the early 1930s, before re-enlisting at the outbreak of the Second World War, leaving a promising Hollywood career to do so, and saw action in France following D-Day. Niven requested, then rather using a simple film prop, he would feel more in character if they were able to provide him with a real Victoria Cross. A call was put out in several papers, and Arthur answered the call. Possibly the idea of a man being called a hero one minute, only to find himself in court the next, really spoke to Arthur given his past experiences. Once again, in his very normal style, he made little fuss about the loan of such a medal. Simply travelling to the head office of the newspaper where he had read the article, and presenting his medal to the receptionist, with a simple statement, if David Niven would like to borrow this, he can. Allowing his Victoria Cross to be used in the film led to him meeting and being photographed with Niven as he visited Shepton Studios as a guest of honour. The pair are said to have got on very well together, despite coming from two very different worlds, with the day ending with Niven promising to take the greatest care of Arthur's VC, and it was a story he was fond of retelling 
and showing off a letter written to him by David Niven until his dying day. His brush with the Hollywood actor got his name and face back into the papers, and this led to a rather pleasant surprise for Arthur. He had long thought that other than his two children, he was the last living member of his family, until, after seeing him in the papers back home in Norfolk, his sister, who he had thought had died some 13 years before, and she in turn assumed he had been killed in that 1941 raid, was able to make contact with him once again. Despite how the modern-day narrative has somewhat shifted on it, Arthur, like many who fought in the First World War, were very proud of their service, and was a long-standing member of the Machine Gun Corps Old Comrades Association. He often met with them and attended events for Victoria Cross recipients, including the 100th anniversary of the medal being held in Hyde Park in 1956, and attended several functions of this kind throughout the 1950s and 60s. Arthur Henry Cross was found dead in his flat by his daughter on the 26th of November 1965, aged 80. The news of his death brought headlines across the country, all hailing him and mourning the passing of a hero, something that he would have been very annoyed about, with his grandson Roy later saying that when he asked him if he thought of himself as a hero, Arthur was always quick to shut it down. He used to say, there's no such person as a live hero, because all the true heroes are dead. He was buried in Stretton Vale Cemetery, a cemetery that also contains the graves of three other Victoria Cross recipients, in a very simple service that he had wished for. The funeral was organised by the Machine Gun Corps Old Comrades Association, and he was buried near his wife and children killed in the Blitz, with his first wife also buried elsewhere in the cemetery in an unmarked grave. Arthur also specified that his grave was to remain unmarked, and for many years it did. It was only after a campaign started by a man named Jeff Willars, who along with the Machine Gun Corps Old Comrades Association, now acting more as an organisation to keep the memory of its former members alive, rather than a sort of social club that it had in Arthur's day, helped get public interest through the magazine This England, and with a mix of public donation, money from his relatives and others, Arthur and his family were given a headstone to mark their grave. But keeping Arthur's original wishes in mind, at first, they tracked down his son, Victor, and asked him if he would give the permission to allow a stone to be there. He agreed that his father and the rest of his family's grave should be marked, and a gravestone was placed there following a service on the 27th of September, 2001, acting as a collective gravesite for all of the family buried there, made of green granite with silver lettering, reading the following. In honoured memory of Corporal Arthur H. Cross, VC, MM, World War I Machine Gun Corps. Died 23rd of the 11th, 1965. Also, Francis G. Cross, loyal wife and mother, and his second wife and children, Minnie, Terence and Mary Cross, died 1941, at peace. His grave can be found in Square 27, grave 43,885. His medals, consisting of the Victoria Cross, the Military Medal, the British War Medal 1914 to 1920, the British Victory Medal 1914 to 1919, King George VI Coronation Medal 1937, and Queen Elizabeth II Coronation Medal 1953, were privately held by his family until 2012, when they were sold at auction on the 19th of April for £185,000 to an unknown buyer and they are not currently on public display. On the 25th of March 2018, a hundred years after his lone mission to recapture the pair of Vickers machine guns, Arthur was commemorated in the village of his birth with the laying of a memorial paving slab by the Lord Lieutenant of Norfolk, Richard Dewson. A road in his native village is also named after him. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. This was Arthur Henry Cross, VCMM, a Norfolk-born hero of the First World War, and this was A Little Bit of History.